see Sister Sister Wong. There'll be opportunity for one or two more. Thank you, Sister. Yes, I can thank the Lord for giving me the Holy Spirit and um, just and um, to understand um, the different accounts that. Uh, are recorded in the Bible and um, and it's for um, our learning. And I was just reading um, the other day about um, the mother of this king, and I believe her name was um, Atalaya, something like that. She was a very wicked woman um, because her her son um, uh, was killed because he was a really really wicked king. He um, he killed all his brethren, um, all his brothers, so that he could um, uh, hold the throne to be the king. And um, but um, you know God's judgment, um, you know, was uh, upon him, and um, and he died. But um, I was thinking how um, he had a son, and and his mother, um, you know, the, the her reasoning was very just, you know, it just um can't understand you know she even wanted to kill her um her her uh, own grandson when um he became king and and he she was like you know just so um not happy and you know and um i was just thinking about uh reasonings um of men and uh, there's just many um just bad ones in the bible and um, other ones I can think of are the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, when Jesus um, raised um, these men that were lame and paralyzed and um, on the Sabbath day. And um, all these men um, could see was that um, that he had uh, performed uh, these works on the Sabbath day and, and yet they were not in awe uh, and giving God the glory that you know, this man have just, um, you know, healed these people that were bound um, in all these illnesses for um, this man. One of them was for 38 years and um, and they did not, um, you know, they read about the laws in the Bible, different things about God. And yet when Jesus was there to show them and, um, you know, God um, is not just someone that is in the in their their laws, but um, He is a God that works miracles. And Jesus was there to represent God, and and they couldn't understand that they they just couldn't see past that, and just makes me um, just consider about my own reasonings um, when um, I go about um, doing things, um, making different decisions. Um, am I um, seeking the Lord um, to the Holy Spirit um, to give me what is best. Uh, what, what what does God say? You know, um, am I asking God to give me His wisdom, um, His reasoning? You know, I just thinking. You know, the talks that we hear, that we come to the meetings. Um, God is trying to reason with us. Um, what is a good way? What is the best way? Uh, how do we stay saved and be happy while we're walking um, on this earth? <laughs> and um, I'm just thinking, you know, um, all these reasonings are God's goodness and his um, um, kindness, um, his righteousness. And to refuse um, these good uh, reasonings, uh, you know, God says, come and let us reason together. And, and that's what we do. We come to these meetings and, um, and hear what God has to say. And, and everything he says is just so good, so perfect. And, and I just love, love hearing his word because it's way better than my own reasonings because I only have my thoughts. <laughs> and, and, um, my thoughts are not, not, um, a lot of time is not according to, um, the spirit and and I praise the Lord for the infilling of the spirit because it, um, I know the Lord will guide me and lead me to um, to where He is in the end and and give me you know all the fruit of the spirit you know everything that I would um, need uh, to overcome myself trials um, things in this life and and just be a blessing and be a help to others and it's just a wonderful salvation and I thank the Lord every day for that. Praise the Lord for our sister's blessing, and uh, 
for God who does go before us in, in all our ways and, you know, in everything that, uh, that we do, um, you know, even, even something as simple as these meetings that, uh, that we have, you know, the, the courses, uh, my, myself, I particularly enjoy the courses and the singing. Um, you know, we've had a few music nights last, over the last year, and uh, I particularly enjoyed that. I think, I think most have, um, you know, the, the opportunity to give testimonies, to hear the word, you know, all these things are there for our benefit. And, um, you know, they're, they're there to, to build us up and to, uh, to have uh, an, an influence upon our lives, uh, an influence according to, as our sister said, according to the spirit and to the, according to the leading and guiding that, uh, that the Lord would have for us, uh, because he knows the way through the wilderness. And uh, all we have to do is follow. That's a chorus, if anyone didn't know that. <laughs> all right, uh, another testimony. How about a brother? A brother with a testimony. We'll have one more. I can pick somebody that works too. Brother Nick Wong. It's your lucky day. Yes, I can certainly praise the Lord for my salvation. And, you know, there's just uh, so much that I can thank the Lord for in my life. And it's a, it's a privilege, you know, even thinking back to. Um, you know, my, my, my walk in, in the Lord and coming at a young age and um, even recently just talking with some co-workers um, at the, I guess, uh, the company Christmas party, as they call it, and there were some that chose not to, to come and sparked some conversation. You know, there were some that uh, said they didn't celebrate Christmas, and I was able to say, yeah, well, we don't celebrate it either, but here we go there, it's free food and company, so, um, you know, why not? And and um, and then just got into conversation, talking about you know Christmas, and, and maybe uh, hear the reasons why they might not celebrate. And and then um, you know there was one particular individual I, I was I got talking to, and some good discussions there with him. And you know, and uh, he was quite intrigued about the Holy Spirit, he himself being a, a Jehovah's Witness, and um, he wanted to to hear more about it. But uh, we we got cut off by something we needed to do at at, at work. But um, we just re rejoice with, with the, uh, the word of the Lord going out. And it's, uh, if anything, it's been much easier to, to even bring up the, the word and, and um, you know, this salvation with, with people around us, uh, even walking around in the malls and people are just running around like crazy. And, you know, we don't have to be caught up in, in all that, that craziness. And, and um, you know, people wonder why we're not, uh, you know, flustered and trying to get things uh, organized and arranged. And. Um, you know, we, we, we have something to tell them and give them and um, even the opportunity now with the resources online and um, the ability to, to listen to, to the words during the week and then giving that that time to, you know, hear what the Lord has to say and, and, and I found myself, you know, listening a lot to words in, in Adelaide and, um, you know, hearing and saying, wow, that was a really good word. I, I really need to hear that. And um, even something I'm able to share with my other brothers and sisters of, of that same same food for the soul and uh, it's just a, it's a wonderful salvation to be a part of, and I praise Lord every every single day for it. Good, thanks, Brother Nick. Good to hear those testimonies, and uh, good to um, to be reminded of of uh, this the salvation that we do have. And you know, I often think, especially of late, something that's been really strong on, on my thoughts is you know, uh, I can't remember where it is, but a verse that says, "And so much the more as you see the day approaching." And you know, there, there's there is a need and a cause um, for us, uh, the Lord's people, to to be ever closer to the Lord, and so much the more, more closer to the Lord than we ever have been. And in that is our safety. And uh, and as we are uh, draw close to the Lord, we have the opportunity to draw others close to Him as well too. By that uh, that um, example that we we set within our own lives according to the Lord, and and that has an impact, that has an effect on the hearts of men. So we'll leave the testimonies there. I'll hand it over to Pastor Smith for the word. Genesis in chapter 7, please. Genesis in chapter 7. What I want to highlight today is just how incredibly privileged we are and how incredibly privileged it is to be invited by the Lord. An invitation. An invitation is something that often, just in a general sense, can be accept, expected. Um, but the more prestigious the event and the more 
exclusive the event, the more valued the invitation should be. You can't get a, a more exclusively privileged invitation than to follow the Lord. And I've given thoughts along the lines of the only sacrifice that the Lord is, is going to accept is a willing sacrifice. I'm not going to talk about those things today, but it is directly related to what we are going to look at as it relates to this invitation. God makes the invitation. He doesn't force us to accept it. And, and that's why our walk is a walk of faith. But also there is a proving and a testing all the way through our walk of whether or not we are worthy for the invitation that the Lord would give us, whether or not we are worthy. If we decline God's invitation, we deem ourselves unworthy of it and therefore will not benefit by our own hand from the bountiful consequences of accepting the, the invitation. This is just a simple gospel principle as we know. But it extends further than that and into our own lives in Genesis chapter 7 in verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteousness before me in this generation. The Lord's looking for the righteous. He saw Noah's heart. He saw his attitude. He saw his diligence. God called Noah to make an ark. And that was an enormous event, an enormous undertaking, a, an incredible sacrifice that Noah had to make to, to put that ark together. It wouldn't have been convenient for him. It would have been many years, I've forgotten exactly how many, but many, many years of hard work. And it wasn't something the Lord forced Noah to do. Noah gave, or God gave Noah invitation. He gave him instructions. He gave him provision. He gave him everything he needed. He gave him the skill, the equipment, and everything in order to get it done. What Noah had to do was accept God's invitation. And because Noah accepted God's invitation to build the ark in the first place, Noah then was able to accept the invitation that God just gave him here to get on the ark. And we know the ark is a parallel of salvation. The Lord's called every one of us to build the ark. We are builders, fellow helpers and fellow laborers together with God. And there are many that have been invited by God himself. Many are called and have for whatever reason, usually related to their own pride, declined God's invitation. Which means when this final invitation is given for us to enter in, into the salvation of the Lord, climb on board the New Testament ark as the Lord Jesus Christ returns, there'll be many that just won't be invited. And, and Jesus confirmed this in the book of Matthew where he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And the five wise and five foolish virgins also um, give us a, a, the same parallel. And so the whole nature of God's interactions with man, especially under the New Testament, is one of extending an invitation. And God said, all day long have I held out my hand to this gainsaying and I think it's a rebellious generation. So God has been extending this, this particular gospel invitation for the last 2,000 years. And sadly, very, very few of, of all mankind have, have accepted that invitation and responded to it appropriately. And that's our um, part in all this. God's made provision and he's graciously given the invitation. Let's go to Micah and chapter 4. I think we sang this chorus based off this verse today already. Um, it's a good chorus. Micah and chapter 4. One of the minor prophets sits just before the book of Habakkuk. Does that help you? 
after Obadiah, maybe that might clarify. Jonah, Micah, Nahum, so on. All right, anyway, Micah chapter 4. You read also very similar passages of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 2, but if you read here in Micah chapter 4, and verse 1, but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it. Jesus had an Im just an incredible, um, the word is magnetism really, where he attracted people to him. He didn't corral and drove them by fear and by force. He extended an invitation. He spoke incredibly, and people responded. He showed compassion to the multitudes, and they saw it. He wept for Jerusalem. He extended an invitation, and not only the invitation made it possible for that invitation to be even given by what he did in dying on the cross. And as a result of that, the testimony of the church will be lifted up by God. But even in the millennium, when Jesus has returned and established his government on earth, a, a situation that's really not that far away, it would seem, people shall flow to it. Verse 2, though, and many nations, this is entire nations, shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of our God and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths and the law shall go forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. Now, Zion is a, a reference to the church who will form part of Christ's government on earth based in Jerusalem. But the nature of this is because of the horrors of the Battle of Armageddon on the earth, those that survive it, which would, it would appear to be sadly a fraction of humanity, those that survive it will have a different attitude. They'll have an, a desire to accept God's invitation God's gracious invitation to be partakers of his ways. And they'll reap the benefit of God's blessing upon them for that. We've got the opportunity to do that now. And by the grace of God, don't have to endure necessarily the horrors of the Battle of Armageddon to adjust our attitudes in a way that makes us, if we're fortunate enough, have the right attitude to accept the invitation. That opportunity for you and I is now, here and now. But be sure of this, God's not going to force you. But be just as sure that your response to God's invitation will determine your outcome in every particular instance. And that's why there's such encouragement and ministry and direction and, and, and many of the talks are directed in that direction. Because as it comes to the plan of salvation, that's done. The invitation, that's given. The invitations are written for the, for the wedding. They've been posted and sent out. All the work is done in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is not yet done necessarily is the response that, that um, we're looking for from some. Those few sheep that will be responsive willingly in the gospel age before it's too late and the door of the ark is closed. But it is an invitation. And whilst we can't really determine how others will react, we give them the invitation, we tell them about it, we present it to them clearly. How they react is up to them. But now that we've found the truth and God's confirmed his word by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. How we respond to God's invitations throughout our life is, is still a critical factor. Just because we've received the Spirit and been baptized, that's good. 
but they that walk in the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And, and the Lord is inviting us all the way through our life to engage with him. And he directs us in ways by invitation that would build up the ark of the, of the New Testament church, that would see his work done, and that would see blessings unfold in your life, all under the proviso of how and whether you respond to that invitation. If we read on here, verse 3, And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. What? I don't think any of us can comprehend the magnitude of the change of the world order that the return of Jesus will bring in. The, the military powers of the nations, especially the most developed and advanced nations, if you were to delete the armed forces and the, the military component, the economies of the world would crumble. The entire world would fall, would fall into a state of anarchy. Wouldn't work now because of the sinfulness and the attitudes of the people. But when Jesus returns, Oh, boy, will things change. And what an incredible change it will be. And our response now to the attitude or to the invitation the Lord gives us every day will directly impact our part in all this and whether we have a part in it at all. Verse 4, But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. And so here's a promise of great um, security for the whole world. You don't need guns. Try telling that to the Americans. You don't need guns. Riots in the streets. I could say some more, but I'll hold off for now. Um, Right, let's go to the book of Matthew, Matthew in chapter 19. Matthew 19. This young man serves as a great example of, and an illustration. And, and again, I don't want to get lost off the main point, the joy that I had, this great invitation, how privileged, how wonderful it is for the Lord to interact with us in a way that invites us to be his laborers. Before we got saved, we were in the same boat everyone else was in, and the invitation we had from the Lord was, come and get saved. By God's grace, when we accepted that invitation, it opened up such a vast range of so many more invitations. Come and be healed. Come and let me provide for you. Come before me and let me lift you up. All these invitations, really, that are the promises of God by faith, that just exploded open to us, when we accepted God's invitation of salvation. And, and so we should learn from that, that the more we accept the invitations God gives us throughout our life, his calling, go here, speak there, do this, do that, whatever it is, the more we accept those invitations, the more blessing we see, the more salvation we're a part of, and the more wonders we have in our life as God's able to bless us more and more. And so we look at this young man in verse 16. Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? In isolation, that question was very reasonable, understandable, and yet in light of the New Testament is full of problems and red flags. He didn't and couldn't have understood that the only thing that he could do 
to receive eternal life was accept the invitation Jesus gave him. That's all he had to do. He didn't understand that, and so he thought there was a bunch of other stuff that was required for him to receive eternal life. What good thing shall I do? And this is an inherent problem in the thinking of, of carnal man that links what we do to our salvation. And, and it continues to come up because what we do is linked to our salvation. And yet, not at all. And, and at the risk of, I don't think I'll confuse any of you because you all understand the righteousness of Christ. But outside of accepting the invitation that Jesus was to, going to give him, that's all he had to do. What followed after that would have been a continuance of that same equation. Follow me and I will make you fishes of men. Go here and rest. Do this and do that. All invitations that as they are just continually accepted, open up the blessing of God and make it available so that his salvation covers us. And, and it's a, I found it throughout my life, a, a very clarifying way to look at things. Rather than, well, I've got to do what the Lord tells me. No, hang on a minute. You actually don't have to do what the Lord tells you to do. You don't and I don't. You don't have to. The Lord is not at this point in history going to force you to do anything. There's no buts about that statement. You can do whatever you like. But the reason you're here today and the reason I'm here today is that we've learned that if we accept the invitation the Lord gives us, we see miracles. We see revival in our lives. We see the miraculous outpouring of the Holy Ghost, things that otherwise you just couldn't ever experience or explain. All because in humility we accepted a gracious invitation. And, and I, my theme, particularly for those, which is pretty much all of us that have been spirit-filled and walking with the Lord for, for some time now, continue to accept the invitation the Lord gives you. It's a privilege that he gives it to you at all. You haven't earned that privilege. You don't deserve it, and neither do I. But it's a great privilege to, to receive the invitation, and it's a privilege to be able to do it. So what do I have to do? Verse 16, verse 17. And he, Jesus, said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. They were still under the Old Testament law. So the legal, technical answer that Jesus had for this young man was keep the commandments. That was a correct answer. That was all that was available to him at that time. Verse 18, he, the young man, said unto him, which, which commandments? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, commit, not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be a false witness, and so on. The Ten Commandments, do them. Verse 20, the young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Now, I don't know whether this young man wanted positive affirmation. I don't know if he was fishing for the Lord to tell him that he was a good boy and that he was all fine the way he was, maybe. Or maybe, if I'm less cynical, the young man might have realised that there was just something not quite right about that, there was something missing, and he wanted instruction. Verse 21, he got instruction, all right. Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Come and follow me. What an incredible invitation from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ directly. And you might say, well, that's a better invitation than I've ever got. No, it's not. No, because your invitation was come and dine. It was you can receive the power of Christ within you by the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. 
You can enter into eternal life. Your invitation was no less significant than this one. In fact, I would suggest yours more so than his. But nonetheless, let's not play it down. Jesus just invited him to be one of his disciples. What an incredible invitation. And you know what he did? He missed the invitation. I genuinely believe he missed the invitation entirely because he was blinded by his own covetousness. He was blinded by his own selfishness. All he could see is, oh, so the way I have to earn salvation is by giving all my stuff away. A minuscule consideration given the magnitude of the invitation. So what? Where's this man today and where's all his stuff? Dust. Every bit of it. So he missed the invitation because the focus of his thoughts was on himself. Verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He went away sorry after he heard the invitation that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave him, come and follow me. A stark warning of human nature, and don't let's not kid ourselves, that human nature is within us. And therefore it's something that we need to consider very prayerfully, that we're inspired with some clarity from the Holy Ghost in how we view the directions the Lord has from us. Because if you see them as invitations that we are honoured and privileged to receive, rather than laborious commandments, our view on our calling will be much different. And this is something that young people sometimes struggle with. They see the salvation as a bunch of restrictions. It's not that at all. It's a bunch of invitations to something far greater And, and so throughout the Gospels, as, as Jesus, and I'm going to summarize here, I want to keep things concise today. As, as Jesus spoke the Gospel, it was frequently said, come and see, an invitation. When they questioned Jesus, who are you? His answer, come and see who I am. When, when Nathaniel was called, the, the same was, was told to him. Come and see. See for yourself. What, what, is, what is come and see? It's an invitation. Come and see. But if that invitation isn't accepted, we won't see anything. You won't be there to see it. Same applies for our eternal life same applies for our calling in the lord same applies for our families you know direction the lord has in every aspect of our life husbands and wives mothers and fathers children what the lord says is come and see my way and if we do that we come and see and what we get from that is what we often refer to it's i guess in-house jargon a little a vision how do we get a vision? By accepting the invitation to come and see. That's how we got saved in the first place. And, and it really is an incredible privilege and a key point in continuing on with the Lord. Let's go to John chapter 21, please. Come and see. Verse 11, John chapter 21 and verse 11. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, full of great fishes, and 153. And for all there were so many, yet was the net, was the, not the net broken. Big story here, they fished all night and got nothing. Jesus gave them instruction. He gave them an invitation. He said, put your nets on the other side of the boat. Didn't have to do it. They weren't forced. 
Jesus invited them to do it his way instead of their way. And I encourage you to look at that as the Lord's instructions for you in your life and even the ministry that you receive from the platform. It's an invitation to stop doing things your way, if that's what you're doing, and do them the Lord's way. And as you put that to the test, the fruit of the blessing of the Lord will always be abundant unless you decline the invitation. Oh, not going to do that. Not going to listen to that direction. Don't have to follow that. You're right. You don't have to. Just as God doesn't have to bless if you don't. It's not a threat. It's just a reaping and sowing principle. So the, the disciples here, which is what made them disciples, they listened to Jesus. They put their, their, um, their nets on the other side of the boat. hope I'm not um, mixing up my fishing stories here. No, I'm not. It's the right one. <laughs> right. We'll read on. Now, before we read on, though, 153. I've seen a lot, and I mean a lot, of mathematical acrobatics around the significance of that number. And most of what I've read and seen around the significance of the breakdown of that number, 153, seems quite plausible. Maybe all of it's right. It is quite a remarkable number. One of the observations that I'm aware of as it relates to 153, if you have um, a bunch of different balls and you form them into a pyramid, right? And, and I'm not going to go into the detailed mathematical equations and names for all this stuff. I'm just going to explain it. A bit like when you play a game of pool and you have all your balls um, on the table and you, you put them into a triangle when you start breaking it, right? So you have one and then underneath one you have two and then underneath that you have three and so on, four and row of five and then row of six all the way down. If you take 153 balls and you put them into a pyramid shape, it gives you a perfect pyramid of 17 layers. So 17 is a direct factor of 153. And 17 in, in numerical significance speaks of security. And if you multiply 17 by, by 9, it's your 153. 9 speaks of finality and judgment. There is certainly a mathematical, numerical significance to this number. Of that, I'm certain. Exactly which one and how many, I don't know. But the point is, when we do things God's way and we take heed to his invitation, we open ourselves up to an extent of blessing we could never imagine the depth of. And, and that's, been our, that's our story. That's our testimony. We just got saved because for whatever reason we, we became convinced it was the right thing to do and we were correct. We accepted the invitation. Verse 13, so they, they got this incredible bounty. It was obviously worth a lot of money. They'd already been blessed by Jesus for doing what he said, for accepting his invitation. They didn't have to do it. Verse 12, Jesus said unto them, come and dine. I think we've got a chorus on that one too. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? knowing that he was the Lord. This was remarkable because this was after the crucifixion. Excuse me, after the crucifixion. So come and dine. Here's another invitation. A different one. Jesus invited them to put their nets on the other side of the boat. They benefited. Now he's inviting them further. I've just blessed you with a whole bunch of fish. Probably wages that'll, that'll see you weeks or months into the future. 
But guess what? I've got another invitation for you. Come and dine. Come and dine. How gracious is the Lord to us all. Verse 13, Then Jesus cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. So he prepared a meal for them. He fed them. And he fed them the same thing that they all had fed the 5,000 when he sat them down in groups of tens, hundreds and fifties. Fish and bread. And how many people, including that young man, could have been part of this? That young man that we read of there in, in, um, previously in Matthew. How many could have been there? But they never got these two invitations because they rejected the first one. That young man could have been here to see. We fished all night with our nets on one side. Jesus said, throw them on the other. And we got 153 fish. He never even heard that invitation. Never got it. Because he wasn't there because he'd rejected the first one. Because they accepted the invitation that Jesus gave them to collect the fish, Jesus was teaching them a lesson. He then had already made preparation to give them another invitation to provide for them, and he cooked a meal for them, come and dine. Where was the young man? Where were the 5,000 people that they'd fed, that Jesus had already fed fish and bread? They weren't there. But the people that were there, the disciples, were the ones who particularly, when Jesus walked up to them out of nowhere and said, come and follow me, they dropped everything they were doing and they accepted the invitation. And that's what struck me. That's what I wanted to really bring forward today. And there's a degree of caution and warning in this. If you deny and you start denying some of the invitations the Lord gives you, Maybe you'll find out that there are invitations the Lord won't give you. That if you had have accepted them, you would have been given. And I'm not going to say maybe, it's certain. Again, it, it fits into the reaping what we, what we sow. And so the invitations the Lord gives us, sometimes they have an expiration date. Sometimes the grace of the Lord, our ability to avail ourselves of the invitation, sooner or later that invitation is withdrawn. And I've seen this happen. I'll give you an example in a minute. It happened with the children of Israel. God made a great provision for them with um, quail and with manna. With, with God called it angel's food taste of which, anyway, wafers and wild honey, I think, was the, was the taste of it. An incredible bounty God laid out for the children of Israel. And he invited them every morning and every night to grab, grab what they needed. How gracious could you get? But he warned them. He said, look, this invitation to, to feed you and keep you alive comes with a Strings attached. It comes with a condition. That condition is accept the invitation every day. Go out and gather what you need every day. And, and we read, it's in Exodus 16. I'm just going to quote it for now. Not all of them did that. Not all of them gathered every day. And the ones that didn't, the, the, the food became unedible. The Bible uses the term it bred worms and stank. It was unedible. And I believe it was a, God, a way God was teaching the children of Israel to value the invitation that he gives them and not take it for granted, not become entitled thinking that, well, I deserve that invitation. If I reject it this day because I don't feel like it, then it'll just be there another day for me to accept then. 
that level of complacency is dangerous because one day it won't be there. I remember many years ago now, some of you may recall, there was a soul that was spirit-filled in, in another province. And I've, I felt strongly led by the Lord to guide and, and invite those people to, to relocate in the course of time to be part of the fellowship in Vancouver. Of course, there was never going to be a forceful situation where they were forced to do so, but it was certainly something I felt strongly the Lord, um, a direction from the Lord, an invitation. Anyway, one day, after quite some years of encouraging in this direction, um, the, the lady came to me with a great revelation the Lord had shown her that that's the invitation, the direction he wanted. It was unprompted, it was unscripted, and it was wonderful. And I remember at the time warning, or, or encouraging, I should say, um, now that the Lord's shown you, the, the clock's ticking. You've got to accept his invitation. And if you don't, then, then you, you might find the blessing that you enjoy so much won't be there. And, and sadly, this story do, didn't have a very happy outcome. The, right at the last minute, we'd made arrangements for all the natural stuff to happen, for them to move in, um, provision, all the necessary logistical considerations were going to be met and we were going to help with that. And then last minute, no, the invitation was declined. And never have I seen a situation work out well when, when it goes down that track. So we need to be very careful of declining God's gracious invitations. They do have an expiry date. Right. Where to finish? Sunday schools come in. Here. Hebrews chapter 4. We'll finish here. Hebrews in chapter 4. I don't think you could get a better invitation than this. When the Old Testament temple was built, the back section of the temple was what was called the holiest of holies, the holy place. That was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, the mercy seat was kept. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was a number of incredible things. Aaron's rod that budded, the Ten Commandments were in there. A pot of manna was in there as well, by the way. But that holiest of holies was blocked off. Access was not given, and, and to, to ensure the separation, there was this great veil. Apparently it was enormous and very, very thick, and, and there wasn't an invitation given for people to go in to the mercy seat to have access to it. It was blocked off. That invitation could not be extended because of the sin of mankind. And so the veil was there to represent the separation between God and man. Man was not invited there. And if he went in there uninvited, he'd be killed. And only once a year was the high priest able to go in under a ridiculously strict set of circumstances. <laughs> and they were that nervous about it that they tied a rope to him so that if he would got it wrong and he got killed, they could drag his body out. And then Jesus died, and he paid the penalty for sin for the whole world. And in doing so, enabled a broad invitation to go out to the whosoever to come and be saved. And so that gave mankind access to an invitation that they never had before. And we read of that here in verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. The fact that we're even able to do that is a miracle. This is an invitation that we may find, may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What, a, what an invitation that is. 
And I'm surprised that God doesn't get more insulted at how often his invitations are turned down. I am. The magnitude and grace of the invitations the Lord gives out, the scale at which he gives them, the, the, the weight of them, and yet how often they're turned down, these invitations. The, the love and the grace and the mercy of God upon the human race is um, unfathomable to me. And so just some thoughts about how incredibly privileged you are to have this great invitation to come and dine, to be part of the wedding feast, to have robes of righteousness, to come before the throne of grace, to have a spot assured on the ark. No matter how you look at it, that is they are world-changing events. You have a front row seat and a stamped invitation to be there. You should never take that for granted, and I'm sure we don't. So I'll leave those thoughts there. I'll ask the musicians to come out the front. We're going to